Great. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's virtual roundtable. Today, we'll be talking with higher education faculty to have a conversation about how to support our graduate students during the times of COVID-19 and this global pandemic. Thank you for taking your time out of your day to join us. We know it's a busy time, but this is also a very important topic. We have over 160 people already registered for this roundtable, so we assume more people will continue to be joining us, even though we have started. We have participants ranging from graduate faculty, assistantship providers, and other professionals who work with grad students, and many current graduate students. My name is Kirsten Fox, and I serve as the director of the Placement Exchange, uh, also known as TPE to most, but I am also a member of the Akuhawai staff. So we thank you for joining us. I am joined today by four esteemed faculty who will be leading the conversation, and I will introduce each of them here in a minute. In the meantime, I want to go over a few housekeeping items. Please be sure to check out our other Akuho I online resources. We have um, many YouTube recordings that have happened in the past few weeks. So I definitely encourage you to check those out online as well. We also have the Akuho I online community. So there have been many conversations and threads of people who have been asking questions, posing questions, and really engaging with the community. So we definitely want to make sure that people are checking this out also. And then last but not least, uh, we have a variety of COVID-19 resources. This is some gathering of various resources from some of our partner associations, as well as information from the CDC and other places. Uh, in addition to our YouTube recordings that are currently posted on our online resources, this will also be recorded and posted. So if others are unable to join us today, you can share this with colleagues and classmates in the future to be able to join. As I mentioned, I am joined today by four wonderful faculty. We have Dr. Danielle DeSowell from Indiana University, Dr. Vijay Kanagala from Salem State University, Dr. Christy Lunsford from Bowling Green State University, and Dr. Kristen Wren from Michigan State University. I will have each of them introduce themselves momentarily. Um, faculty, thank you so much for taking your time out of your busy schedules to be able to be here today as well. I'm going to quickly uh, talk about some of the ways to engage in this webinar. As uh, any good graduate class with faculty, we would want this to be as interactive as possible and really conversation based. You know, it wouldn't be a faculty uh, presentation, if a good one here in student affairs and higher ed, if it were lecture based, right? The best conversations are really interactive and discussion based. So we want all of our participants that are here today to be active as well. And you can have a really robust conversation by using features um, of the webinar setting. One that I want to make sure everyone is familiar with is the question and answer button. So if you look on your screen, you should see a Q&A on your Zoom menu. Um, please use this to be able to ask questions. You can also use this to comment. It's a great place uh, to make sure the conversation continues to move forward. If you are asking a question, we also ask that you put your name and institution. It's important to note that all of the questions are visible to all participants. So if you do ask a question, um, I do wanna make sure you're aware that it will be visible to others on the webinar today as well. Um, if you are a graduate student or faculty or a, a student affairs professional working with grad students, maybe you might wanna mention that as well so we can address kind of your question appropriately. As I said, we have potentially over 160 people joining us today. Uh, it's a great panel of experts. We know there could be lots of great questions and comments. You can upvote questions that you like. So definitely feel free to use that feature as well to make sure that we take the time to address these. We may also ask you if you would be willing to ask your question to the group. There is also a raise hand feature. And so you can raise your hand and then we can call on you to ask a question of the group. 
I would actually love to see if we can get make sure this raise hand feature works right now. So if everybody wants to try to raise your hand, oh, I can see we've got, oh, they're raising, they're raising, they're raising. Excellent. Excellent. Great. I was going to say, if you can get, keep raising them as long as you can hear us and see us. And that looks like it is working. So wonderful. All right. Well, with that, I am going to turn it over to our panelists. The features are working. Um, again, I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves as they start the conversation. Um, but I'm going to ask uh, Dr. DeSowell to start and if she could first not only introduce yourself, but please give a brief overview of how you are addressing COVID-19 and working with your grad students currently. Danielle, you need to unmute. I should probably unmute myself. So my name is Danielle Diesel, and I am clinical professor and coordinator of the Higher Education Student Affairs Program at Indiana University. I'm very pleased to be here with you all today. So I think some of the things that um, that we're doing is thinking about this from the different audiences that we have. So we have first years and we have second years. We're a two-year master's program. So we have first year students who are needing um, to have haven't talked about what the summer looks like. So lots of folks have internships. So talking through and really looking at where are you with that process um, really early on sent a note to students that said um, you need to reach out and start to ask some some questions about your summer internship process and then gently started nudging for what are we going to think about for plan b um, if something happens at this point so i think kind of thinking about those students and what that process looks like and then also talking with them about how they're going to return in the fall and that there is no return as we've seen it in the past. And so when we return to campus, it will look different and our access will be different as well as how we bring in the new cohort will be different. So really kind of starting to prep for some of those cultural changes that will happen internally within an academic program. When we talk about the second years who are getting ready to job search, whole nother scenario. <laughs> so lots of different types of resources. So um, optional types of sessions that I've set up for the students in regards to job searching during a pandemic, um, thinking about kind of what's retirement and benefits and how does that play into the future, um, checking in with general kinds of understandings of how to navigate some of the fiscal pieces that are happening right now that they may or may not have awareness of, but all essentially making all of those pieces optional but accessible to all the students. Along with that comes a set of resources that I send out before we get into some of those Zoom calls that then I outline what the resource is providing information regarding so that we can then have a conversation about <laughs> why did I send you this piece from Inside Higher Ed? Why did I send you this piece about COVID-19 and how higher ed is going to come back online or the options that comes from a business source so that they can start to think about what that looks like. Overall, for all of them, offering uh, virtual happy hours. So <laughs> access to faculty in a different kind of frame, super easy, but um, kind of segmented by first years and second years. And then we'll do one towards the end of the semester for both first years and second years to come together. But a space to kind of just talk in general and also get a sense of where they are, what's that kind of feel like, what they've been doing in their home environments in order to um, continue to have that community building. And I'll let it go there. Thank you. Dr. Kanagala. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Vijay Kanagala. I use he and pronouns, and um, I am an associate professor at um, Salem State University in Salem, Mass. And I also have the privilege of coordinating our, our HESA program here, Higher Education Student Affairs Program. Um, I think I, it's, I probably should just say ditto um, to everything that Daniel just said, um, right, in, in terms of how 
we've engaged with our students. Um, ours is a practitioner. You know, we have tenure track faculty and practitioner faculty, uh, practitioners who are in you know at Salem State or at, at, at you know we're in the Boston area. So we have the privilege of working with so many different uh, practitioners who come and teach in the program. So it's been a it, it's been a great opportunity to actually use the the practitioner model in, in this situation. Um, much like what Daniel said, and I think um, the way that I've thought about this for my program as the coordinator was to come up with a plan for the, um, for the second year students who will be alumni of the program in less than about a month. Um, and the first years will be a rising second years and then the incoming cohort. So thinking of three different populations in, um, within the program and having um, you know, to understand the needs. And you know, ideally, normally we would have thought of them as one big program and you know, very similar needs, but um, but in this case, they have very unique needs um, in in thinking, especially about the second year. Job search is one part, but the other the other thing that came up, um, which I think most of our grad students are probably thinking about, is you know courses in that they're taking right now, um, and the transitioning to remote teaching and learning. Um, you know, and what does it mean for assignments? You know, how are faculty going to grade them? Um, anxiety around practicum as students are in their final semester with practicum needs. Uh, with most of our schools, you now the practicum site shut down. Um, so we had to come up with a plan to address that. And the way we did that was to basically tell them that our school, um, you know, started spring break, um, you know, the week of March 16th. Um, so we said, you no, know, March 13th was the last day um, of, of uh, on-site practicum requirements. And then the academic part of you know, in class, we still you know, met with them on, you know, over Zoom, um, engage with them. Um, get, I, I guess, I, I think the broader you know, thing message was, how do you create space for them to just come and talk and, and be part of this, right? To de-stress and, and process. Um, and, and how do you um, eliminate things that were normal before, like assignments that you know, we were you know, gung-ho about making sure that you know, APA and you know, number of pages and I mean, those kinds of things seem very trivial in the moment. So, so how do you then make sure that our students feel like your faculty and your you know, supervisors and your you know, administrators on campus care enough to make sure that they're gonna be okay? Um, and I think that was a big part. Um, for the incoming class, um, I'll come with, we'll, we'll you know, talk about the, the rising second years in a bit, but uh, for the incoming class, it was also a new experience because you know, we were recruiting you know, our students and um, I think, um, I don't think I've had to deal with students that um, in the past where students, you know, were not able to graduate um, this, this May because, you know, they had requirements they were not able to fulfill. I had a couple of students who had assistantships accepted, um, but were not able to finish their undergraduate, you know, program um, for whatever reason at that institution. And so trying to renegotiate what that might look like for them, right? Um, things that, you know, things that we didn't have to deal with before. So um, that was a big part. But overall, I think for me was to make sure that our students were, um, knew that the faculty in the program and the, in, in the School of Now Graduate Studies and the School of Education where I'm at, um, you know, our deans were supportive of them and that we're gonna take care of them. So I'll, I'll stop at that. Great, thank you, Dr. Kanagala. Uh, Dr. Lunsford, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you, Kirsten. And, and welcome to everyone. Thank you for having me here. I'm really excited to, to spend some time with you all. Uh, my name is Christina Lunsford. I'm an associate professor at Bowling Green State University. I serve as our interim department chair and I coordinate both our master's um, program in college student personnel and our PhD in higher education. So um, <laughs> yeah, this is unprecedented time as we know. Um, We've, I'm learning a lot from my colleagues who have spoken today and then some of the things I will add. Our university is really taking a case management approach to call each student to see where they're at and they started in different places. Um, we did that internally with our graduate students where I have two graduate students who work in our office and a, an, a half time appointment administrative staff. So we called each and every student and really tried to figure out what their needs are and where they were at with all of this to make sure they have the resources they needed, to see if they had questions about um, their, their courses or um, supervising their, um, their supervising experiences and their practicum experiences. So, and really um, have treated each person as a case caseload, a case management 
philosophy. So making sure those are um, getting the resources they need and they're closed out as we move on. So I think that's been really helpful to hear from each of our students um, because there's a lot of mental health things that are happening as we know. And um, it's hard for students to even think about coursework when they're in that state. So I think that's been our first and um, foremost um, concern. Um, we've instituted a policy across campus where students can change their grading option to a, a pass, no pass. So trying to help students figure that out and navigate that, that's take some, taken some of the pressure off of their academics. Um, we have two capstones, two sections of our capstone course for graduating master's students. So I feel like, and I teach one of those sections, which is good for me because I'm, I've been in those conversations with the students as they transition out and trying to make sure they know some things we anticipate all the time, like if it's a delayed um, time frame before they get a job. So do you have a backup plan for where you're going to live and how you're going to eat in the meantime? But also they don't they don't know that yet. So trying to make sure they understand like some of this is we know how to function with this and others of this is just brand new. So I think the finding out um, like time towards when they're going to get a job. That's one thing. The other thing is making sure they know that their job search is now changed. Their functional area may be different. Their location may be different um, and they might not plan to stay as long as they did in their first job after their degree as they did in the past and what they do with that. And some of that um, deals with some of the things that Danielle mentioned about financial resources and, um, and how that sets you up for a career at a place, which I know we'll get into later. So I think those are some of the things that are, have been on our mind in a general way. And the other thing is how we celebrate um, commencement. And a lot of our students are, are really upset that they're not going to have commencement. And I, I think um, commencement has been a long time for me. So I, for me, that wasn't the most pressing thing, but I forgot that that's so present for them. So I, I try to make sure I'm hearing them and trying to figure out what's a realistic way to celebrate and um, try to meet people's needs and expectations for that. But I would like to get them back on campus at some point to hood them in person and those types of things. So um, I think that's what I would share in my general comments and then I have some specifics that I'll share later. Great, thank you. So yeah, they've worked hard for a couple of years so they wanna celebrate with commencement. Uh, Dr. Wren, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Kristen. Um, and thanks, colleagues, for being here. I just skimmed down the uh, participant attendee list, and there are several Spartans and several friends. There's also many, many very experienced um, colleagues, faculty, uh, and administrators on that list who we hope will chip in later with ideas. So several of the same kind of ideas that Danielle and Vijay and Christina are working on, or Christy are working on, um, I want to pull a couple more ideas forward. One is that, like, if anybody can sort of figure out how to uh, deal with this holistically, I think it should be people who work in student affairs. So I think that we have a huge advantage. And when I talk to my colleagues in other academic fields, um, or a niece who's about to graduate from law school, um, thinking about the advantages we may have as a field and sort of using our resources and how we think about things. So as I think about the, the case management approach or how we celebrate people, how we are um, helping people think forward, I, I think that's one of our advantages. I want to say that we have been thinking um, a lot about our incoming students as assistantship offers are, I'm not sure we've had any pulled yet, but certainly have been closing down around us and thinking about the ethics of taking an admitted student, um, you know, should someone come to a student affairs master's program um, without an assistantship, which we do permit in our program, but of course, you know, financially, it's not a particularly great idea, but compared to a job market that is also not going to have a lot of options for them. Is that a better choice? How do we help people think through that and, and sort of have the information they need? Is that different if you're an in-state or out-of-state student? So trying to be very ethical as we think about, you know, enrolling a student without an assistantship um, in this uncertain context in higher ed, but also an uncertain context outside higher ed. So thinking through some of that um, has been some of the work we've been doing. Um, working with our first years, who many of ours will do a practical placement in their second semester. So um, I think like uh, Vijay said, they kind of can't cut theirs at the midway point. Um, we were actually past our midway point when we went to remote teaching um, with an hour and a half notice, just by the way, that was our campus did that in an hour and a half. Um, but thinking through with our students as well as the students who are thinking about summer. So a lot of individual conversations, um, a lot of mental health related conversations, particularly concerned for some of our undocumented students um, and how their options are different uh, from some of our documented students. Um, 
So that is some of the preoccupations we have. Um, very fortunate on my campus that Dr. Miko Blaylock is coordinating our program right now and has been in daily conversation with students on and off campus. Um, so that's sort of in general what we've been doing at Michigan State University. Great, thank you all. I uh, want to turn it over to some additional questions and please feel free to keep using the Q&A feature. I see we've already had a couple come in as well as some hands being raised. So that's great. We will uh, get to those hand questions. But uh, Dr. Red, since you just mentioned summer as well, and actually each, each of you mentioned summer, one of the questions we received from Carrie Yennington, uh, Yarrington, excuse me, is what are we doing to support our grads who are supposed to complete an internship, maybe in a Kuhawai internship or a NOTA internship or another internship, but are no longer able to do that? Uh, and what advice have you given your grads? Uh, what support have you given them? I could, I could speak a little. Um, our county, I, I live in a, if you don't know Bowling Green, we're in a small college town. And um, our county just um, announced a fund to help students who thought they would have employment for, uh, or some kind of employment has been impacted by COVID-19 to help pay for rent and utilities. So I think that um, for those students who are planning, who are planning to leave but are now here and their residents, that, that would help some of them through that process. Um, we're, I think it's at a time where we need to now go back and say, okay, who is hiring? What are the options? If there are things we could do on campus, maybe they could do a practicum for credit, but that doesn't bring an income, but that's a way to make progress towards a degree while we're working on some of their resources. We've um, added one additional course because we had to cancel our study abroad course. So we're trying to make sure they have enough offerings to make it useful for them to well, to be here, but our summer is on off campus or online anyway, uh, but so they can make progress towards a degree and get the units in. Um, but I think looking at resources for them to support is the bigger issue right now, trying to figure out how to have them have income and be able to live in, and eat while they're living in the summer. Building on that, and that's a great idea, Christy. I'm, I'm taking some notes myself. Um, thinking about are there uh, so for our students who are planning to be other places, are there Michigan State-based internships we can provide um, that will be, you know, virtual until our governor lets people be more close, but we, you know, students who had planned to go away, we could use some help with our own conversion to an all online summer orientation program. So there may be some ways that through our own networks on campus, we can create some more opportunities for students. I have talked to several students with NOTA and I think at least one with an Akuho I that uh, summer replacement that have talked to their supervisors who are going to try to make it work and, and really use, you know, give them a full experience. So I think there will be some that will go ahead even at a distance. Yeah, I'll add to that, um, Chris, is that I have the same thing. I have um, probably about two thirds of the students have indicated that their placements are still a go, but they're not physically going to those locations, but the um, those spaces have confirmed that they will continue to pay them and that they're just moving them into a virtual environment. For my other third, um, the first thing that I tell them to do is to check with their immediate supervisor for summer um, work because, and I explain to them that you would not be considered a temporary worker. And so a lot of the internships that are getting cut are because they would show up in a space and have to be entered into a system as a temporary worker. And if you're on a freeze, then that's not gonna happen. And so even though I use on a freeze, they're still in the system getting paid. And so if their supervisor can make the case for continued work, they have a better shot at that than they necessarily do trying to add in a new temporary position. So the other thing I try to do is also provide the students with some um, realistic understanding of why I'm giving them the suggestion I'm giving them, <laughs> even though it might not seem to be the sexiest idea at that time, but it will give them the income um, component if they're, if they're looking for that to kind of check with that. And so I've gotten a good response from most of those after we have that conversation, they write back and they say, I just checked with my supervisor and they said, absolutely, I can help them for the summer. Um, so I think sometimes that's always a good place to initially start to confirm at least a funded type of option. 
That's great. That's great. Thank you. So staying a little bit on the career trajectory element. So those were really about summer internships for rising second years. Each of you touched on this a little bit in your introduction, but when we think about the current economic situation and the growing number of institutions that are implementing hiring freezes, what guidance or advice have you been giving your graduate students during their search in this less than ideal economic uh, time frame? Um, I, I could you know, start with, with that question. Um, I think something that we've talked about with our students was, again, this was in the capstone course and, and we have two, two sections of the capstone course um, with two different faculty. One is a you know, tenured faculty member and another is a practitioner faculty. Um, and we've had conversations around what does it mean to um, translate the experiences that they're having right now? You know, we very similar to uh, what Dr. Lunsford talked about, we have a case management system on campus all of our grads have been helping, you know, touching base with, with the undergrad students to make sure they're okay with registration, also starting for them for, for fall. Um, so what does it mean to, um, to be nimble enough to translate everything that they've learned in these past few weeks and what they're gonna be doing in the next few months to be assets that they can use in the job search, to be able to speak about their experiences, to speak about the skills that they've gained now having to deal with the situation um, in the job search. That's one part. Um, and fortunately for me, I live in the Boston area. So, um, you know, with, with the number of institutions that we have here, a few of our students were able to um, find positions in the last few weeks. Um, you know, I, I don't know how it'll look like in the next couple of months when, when we start having, you know, um, hiring freezes. But, but in the moment, it looks like some of the students were able to successfully get those positions. So, so it gives me hope that it's going to be okay. Um, no, at least, at least temporary hope, right? That, you know, that, that even if one student gets a position right now, that's for us to celebrate. Um, um, the, the other part of it is to also, I, I mean, we do have students who are anxious around what's going to happen, right? Um, you know, long, long term. Um, one of the things that you know, I hosted uh, four um, Zoom forums with our students, two for the first year students, two for the second year students. Um, and one of the things that um, a student mentioned in, 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 the, in our conversation was, you know, before all of this happened, you know, he was pretty set in terms of the kinds of positions that he wanted to apply, um, that kind of institution he was going to apply to. And now, um, at least for the short term, for at least for the next year, maybe the next couple of years, you know, he's changing his his um, requirements or his you know his needs in a, in a way to be able to be um, flexible to apply for positions that might be open that he you know he's able to transfer his skills that know that he has right now in one office but can easily shift and transfer to another position um, depending on you know the position that's available um, and so that was a that was an opportunity for folks to start thinking around um, you know if I was if I was working in res life. And if we're not going to have students on campus, what kinds of you know, positions can I apply to um, in fall uh, if, if, if those you know, live-in positions don't have materialize? So. I'm going to build a little bit on that. I think that um, the idea of creativity and flexibility is going to be really important and thinking not just about different functional areas, but different industries. You know, where else outside of higher ed are the skills that we that we develop in student affairs helpful um, HR in corporations that sectors that may be thriving or that may thrive again sooner um, diversity training in, in HR like where are the places that our students can transfer some of those skills to because there will be a contraction in the market um, I picked up a question in the Q&A about those of us who worked in the last recession the 2008 recession um, is this sort of similar no this is radically different and worse in terms of what's happening for the higher ed job market. Um, and I think a, a, a large piece of this, as I see it, um, when we remove place-based revenue, um, and I hate talking like this, but when we reduce like place-based revenue, like closing everybody's conference online, you know, or residence hall-based conferences for the summer, so there's no summer income, um, and then people refunded a bunch, um, those were always from the really steady jobs. Like even in the 2008 recession, we're like, yeah, you might not get a job in study abroad, but can you live as a hall director for two more years? Because they're going to have to hire hall directors. They're going to have bodies paying rent. They're going to do that. But our giant rent revenue system is 
wildly disrupted and campuses may not hire bodies for those spots um, or they may go with one hall director for every two halls or something but thinking about this is a completely differently radically different um, market disruption and so people being even more creative or outside of higher ed because of the jobs that we could sort of always count on even in the recession aren't going to be there necessarily for this fall i do think they'll come back i'm, I'm a believer in that part of it but um that's where i think that the creativity um is going to be pretty important i'll, I'll just add a couple of things um, we, we have a student who decided to do a second master's degree just to make you know wait a year doing a one-year master's degree in human resources to wait a year to enter the job market this had buy a little bit of time so i thought that was a very creative she was she was location bound and she didn't she didn't know she knew she wouldn't have that many options but um i think that's a good idea um and the other thing and this is where it comes back to what danielle mentioned at the beginning the financial implications of the job market now because typically when you're hired, you're hired based off of the market value for that degree at the time you're hired. And that really sets, if you stay at a university, that sometimes sets your salary for the duration at that school. So back to my original comment about, um, you know, being flexible about how long you stay somewhere or the perfect position. Um, I think that's really important to consider. And um, the other thing, and another person mentioned this too, about you know, change in functional area, making sure you're marketable. Um, but I think students make, need to make sure they're really, really realistically open to that and not have this <laughs> sulk on their face when they're interviewing like this, I really don't wanna be here. And <laughs> because I think that, that your, you know, your presence matters and I think that not everyone is able to hold that in a certain way. But I think that some people who've taken jobs they didn't anticipate had a great experience. So I know there's a lot weighing on people now and you're, you're fighting for positions in a space that how you approach that matters and that comes off to people. And I think once people land those positions, they're probably gonna end up being better than they might anticipate. And their, their dream job might not be that great either. So I think some perspective taking is important too. Those are all great, great points. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna add to that. The other thing that I've been sharing with our second years is that um, they need to be ready for the fact that the job description that they're hired to do will most likely not be the actual job that they do. So um, if we don't have students who come back physically to campus in the fall, then what institutions are doing right now as we're adapting to the summer is that there's reassignment so that folks who would typically deal in a physical space are now moved to an area on campus to help with where there might be some overload in the virtual environment. So they need to be ready that for the first year, they're probably not going to do what's actually listed on that job description and be ready to be flexible for that team environment of I'm going to help where I can help in order for all of us to get through the process. Great, thank you all. As I always tell our candidates, this will not be the job you retire from. So keep that in perspective as well. Um, switching topics a little bit, I'm going to go to a couple of the uh, question and answers that came in. So Candy Mink Salas, uh, Program Director, College Counseling and Student Development at Azusa Pacific asked the question, how are faculty beginning to plan for the impact of course content? Not the technology piece, uh, not the online pedagogy, but actual changes to curriculum content based on this experience that we are having and the impacts of higher ed. I'll jump in and start. Um, I think that I'll be doing a fair amount of what I have done this semester on the fly, which is always go back to what are our program goals, what are the CAS standards for student affairs CSP programs, what are the really essential learning outcomes, and, um, and then looking at my pile of all the wonderful extras, um, like, oh, wouldn't it be great if they also could learn and fill that in with a million other things, which has sort of been my history. Um, and I think that pairing it back to, to what's really essential to know will both create more bandwidth for students um, and also create a little more space to really um, leverage the current situation for what more we can learn from it on the go. 
Um, but in this semester, sort of the, the midpoint uh, transition I've made is looking at enough, like what is enough to meet our, what were our intended learning outcomes? Let's get those and not the 700 extras that I thought would be also cool if you could learn all those other things. I still keep them there and I intend to continue to keep them there and work with students outside of class on those. But if we can get to enoughness and feel okay with, you know, learning what we actually say you'll learn in this program is actually enough. Um, is part of where I'm going in thinking about my fall um, course design, um, which is probably good pedagogical practice anyway, right? Like not just like uh, that, that higher ed practice of kind of keep adding new stuff and just kind of keeping all the other stuff around it, um, but really re-examining so I can refocus on the most important things. And most important, including students' holistic experience, which will be um, extra challenging in different kinds of ways. Um, I think for me, um, you know, um, part of it is to change my attitude um, towards how I engage with um, content in the classroom, um, I think is a big part, because obviously we're socialized to have, you know, like what Chris was saying, we have all of these things that we want them to learn and, um, you know, whether it's NASP ACP competencies or whether it's, um, you know, CAS standards or all the theories that we want them to have. Um, in, I think of before even COVID happened, I think part of my own journey in terms of thinking about you know, the courses was how do I make sure that the stu students understand that um, you know, when, when we start, now let's say, let's say that it's an introduction to a student affairs course and um, it's an introduction. And, and so we're gonna only touch upon some of those things, but you know, they have two years to kind of like grasp some of the other concepts that I might wanna teach them um, you know, in that course. Um, but also that because it's a, as a practitioner, field in, in many ways that some of the learning is actually going to also happen outside of the classroom, right? Like we all know. And so, so kind of like introducing that, like reintroducing that and re, you know, you know, kind of like, like making sure that our students understand that not, not only in a, in a, um, in a philosophical sense, but actually, you know, kind of like internalize that so that they don't feel like, you know, they're getting cheated out of a, a classroom experience, but to make sure that we have that. Um, in terms of content, um, I'm, I'm going to be more focused, I think. Obviously, I'm still thinking about it as I go right now. Um, but, but be very specific around you know, the course goals um, and what the program wants to do. Um, what, what, is, you know, what is my program at Salem State? Um, you know, what, what is our mission? What's our vision? Um, what are objectives for our students? Um, and aligning them with all of our courses. And obviously, you know, we're also starting to think about um, you know, we may or may not be meeting on campus in fall. You know, most colleges are starting to think about that option. Um, and so how do you prep for that? And, and I know the question wasn't about you know, pedagogy, but, um, but, but there is something to be said around students, the incoming students also having a sense of disappointment, right? And so how do you also address that um, to make sure that um, we, we, we're going to have a good experience and to make sure that pedagogically aligned with those expectations that students may also want to have um, in, in terms of their thinking around what graduate school experiences. Um, you now people have romantic ideas of what graduate school um, experiences need to be or ought to be. Um, so, so how do you, how do you foster them and, 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 and nourish them so that you know, students feel valued and, and welcomed onto our campuses? I think, I think oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Oh. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I think for me, the um, the pieces at this point in time that help to shift some of um, some changes in the content in the classroom are what our campus partners are telling me they need these students to do in their assistantships. So if there's a lot of reassignment happening or there's shift is, shifts in duties, then how can I help with the associated outcomes that we have aligned with the program that are going to naturally connect, but what do they need some emphasis on so that I can help the student be successful both in the classroom as well as in the practice-based experience. So um, is that more information about um, the impact of the budget. So while Chris doesn't like to talk about it, I actually do like to talk about it. <laughs> and what happens when the revenue doesn't come in um, and what are the implications and, and then really kind of thinking about then how do we think about some of the decisions. So when we would, if we're 
we have a lot of funds, then we may make different decisions about what we offer students. Um, whereas when we have less resources, we may think about that process slightly differently, but still think about how do we achieve the same goal. Um, and so what is it that the um, campus partners need in that partnership that we have for why they have to have an assistantship to begin with um, in that environment? And um, the couple things I would add um, um, are, <laughs> one is that for our transitioning out students, they've received almost all the course content by now. So they're making sense and wrapping up, <laughs> wrapping it up. So I've used um, our case studies are now this is a case study. So making sure they're learning as we're living it. And then um, also trying to role model effective practice and and share conversations that I've been that influence the decisions and um, you know talk about how my personal values and ethics influence how I contribute and what I think should happen as we do with our graduating students. The other thing is that um, from, a, from a real logistic matter about how we're going to get through all this course content, our university just announced a 27 to 28 million dollar potential cut in our budget. We're looking at shifts and workload for the fall and spring semester. So people might be teaching an extra course. And with that, we might have to change the cut out an assignment or change the nature of assignment. So we have some signature assignments in our program. So thinking about, okay, if they don't do this in this particular class, how are they going to make up those things in other courses? And what are we be going to be okay not covering in their, in their, with this cohort? So I think those are conversations we have to have in a, um, for logistical reasons. And I think it's so important that faculty work together to make sure we know what's happening in, in other courses to make sure that at the end of the day and end of the program, we're still meeting our intended outcomes and what we want our students to know. But we're, we just started those conversations this week and we will have to take a hard look at our curriculum because realistically, I don't think we'll be able to, to do what we used to do. Hopefully it's a short term solution, but um, it might be a good opportunity to rethink some of our overall curriculum. Great, thank you all. And I noticed that others have also weighed in on this question on the Q&A. So again, I encourage you to keep uh, looking there and engage with others. I am going to ask another question and then after this one, I'll probably turn it over and I might ping a few of you to see if you'll go live on air to ask your question. But I see that Rachel Friedenson, an assistant professor at St. Cloud State University, has mentioned she keeps hearing from a lot of her students that the increase in virtual meetings and their jobs and assistantships is getting exhausting. Uh, do you have any creative ideas for engaging and supporting students not using Zoom, WebEx, channels like we're using today? I, um, I, I can share something quickly, but I, um, our Dean, Dawn Chanu, she's, she's been excellent through this whole process, but she shared an article with us about how we shouldn't just move everything off campus. We need to rethink the nature of how we do things and how often we meet for how long and hopefully for, in higher ed that will change the nature of meetings forever, but who knows. Um, so, and I can, sh I can share that or provide it with you, Kirsten, to, to put on the website, but it's been really good to rethink how we meet and for how long and, and why we meet. So maybe it's um, morning check-ins just for 30 minutes or 20 minutes as needed, and then not to check in the rest of the day. But I think having really long meetings just for the sake of filling time is not effective. Mm -hmm. And we can't just move everything remote. We have to rethink everything that we do. And she's challenged that in multiple spaces that I have um, witnessed. And I think it's been really effective and people are really doing that. I'll add a couple things happening in, um, I, I also serve as an administrator at Michigan State for our provost office for undergraduate student success. And one thing we've done there is cut all what used to be hour long meetings to 45 minutes give people that 15 minutes in between, that 15 minutes you used to use to walk across campus and look at the docs or whatever. Um, so that actually helps with that part about like, well, if it's only 45 minutes, we have to use our time differently. So one suggestion is to, if our students can push that out into their workplaces, just to really say like, let's just cut the time. The other thing is our, um, one of our associate deans of our college uh, has gotten, um, I confess I have not joined up, but we have things like a, um, a virtual fitness, 
thing where people can go log their minutes walked or minutes petting their cat or whatever they're doing. Um, so I, that's fitness, right? Like mental health and wellness. My, pet, my cat serves that role for me. So thinking about what are some ways that um, we can be encouraging well-being behaviors for people to be doing on their own and then come back and maybe share those um, but not have to do them all together would be, would be an idea. And, uh, but also to stay out of that whole like hashtag essay fit uh, competition thing like that. Um, I see a lot on Twitter of the uh, uh, productivity uh, humble bragging. Gosh, I got really tired of my 12th mile of my 27 mile run today. Um, so I think that um, doing it in a way that doesn't feed the um, competitiveness would, would be important. Competitive yoga sounds like a terrible idea, right? Yeah, um, just to, I mean, the, with the Zoom feature and you know, anything that had video features on it, I think something that I've suggested, and, and students have been, you know, even for my classes, I've used this, where I've given them permission not to turn on the video um, and to just call in if they need to, right? So it's a simple thing of not having to stare at a, um, a screen all day. Uh, and I've done that, you know, the last few weeks where I was in meetings, you know, back to back and end of the day, I'm just tired. And, I, and the way that I de-stress is go watch TV before I go to bed. And I don't want to watch TV after looking at the screen for so long. Um, so that's one part. But the other part would was, I think there are a couple of students in our program where, um, you know, they work in the same office and they've team tagged. And one person has volunteered to take notes for all of the meetings. Um, so the other person is off, you know, for the meeting. You know, obviously they checked in with a supervisor and they've done that. Um, and then and maybe the next meeting, the other person gets to be on the meeting and the other, no, the, the first student you know, decides not to be in the meeting. Um, so some, some, something about, you no, know, I, I, think, I think part of it is to be creative with how we do this now um, so that our students are not taxed. Um, because with the case management system, they're actually having to connect with students either by phone or by video. And that's adding to the workload, um, obviously. And, with remote teaching that's also added to their um, the number of times that the number of hours they spend in front of the screen so I, I will add one thing Kirsten if it's okay um, I just got out of our chairs of directors meeting and we were talking about a lot of these concerns of meetings and how we're doing our work but I think one thing we often we also have to remember is that our kids are out of school and so when we're scheduling meetings all day, there's some of us that actually need to help our kids during the day that they're, you know, they're home too. So I have a seven year old, I have no idea what she's doing right now. <laughs> but I, but I worried about her getting behind in her schoolwork too. And I, I've had to give myself some grace and all of that and just let a lot go knowing I'm going to do a lot of makeup over the summer and the weekends aren't really weekends anymore. But I think we have to be cognizant of that for all of us in the, all our different roles across campus. We have multiple roles we're playing and no one, very few people have childcare and some people are single parents and, and take care for other people. So I think we need to remember that when we're scheduling meetings and um, I think that's easier to forget if, if we're not in those situations. Thank you. That's a great point. I, I threatened my two children with their lives before coming on this webinar so they would leave me alone. Um, and I, I think much, much of what you're saying actually goes to one of our other questions, really thinking about the mental health and well-being. Um, I saw that Paul Tons asked specifically about, you know, some of these courses can already be isolating for students. It's hard to, to stay focused. There's so many other distractions, right? Life is still happening outside of graduate school. Um, many of us are worried about family members, people that we can't go and see and hug and those types of things. And, and I think if there's just any other tips that you would have or advice um, for both sort of that overall wellness and how you also then keep the students focused so that they can continue to progress towards uh, successful completion of their degree. I could, I could take a first stab. Um, one of my students made a good point yesterday when we were in a meeting and she's like, I just, I just, I know I'm not okay and I don't know what I need. And I think we experience that with people who have different senses of loss or in different um, places in their lives. But I, I'm trying to think of more creative ways to be more um, assertive to say, okay, how about we do this? Come to the park, we can social distance, let's get out. 
Um, but I think that those are some things that are weighing on my mind for those that are very isolated, who really need that interaction, don't know what they need, are fearful, want to be home, um, but trying to figure out ways that I could suggest or just say, okay, we're going to do this, let's do this. <laughs> so I think those are, uh, that's one example, but, um, you know, I point them in direction to resources, but sometimes you just need more than people directing you to resources. So I'll, I'll open with that and see what my colleagues have to add. I feel like some of this depends a bit sort of on our, the, um, the location and the philosophy around some of the distancing that is being taken. I think there are some of us who work in locations where that would be seen as, you know, great, like we're gonna come take a seven feet away walk and kind of shout across the pathway at each other and that'll be fine. And there's other of us who work in places where that would be like, um, not cool. That would be seen as kind of dangerous. And um, I think that thinking about how, where each of our context falls in that sort of matters. Um, Cause Christy, when you said that my response was like, <clears throat> you know, like I, I happen to be at a quite, uh, how do I say it? Um, uh, maybe a con I, I'm in a context of people con interpreting fairly conservatively. Um, our social distancing, um, like getting your temperature taken before going to a campus office building, which you shouldn't be doing anyway. So I think that um, some of that varies. And when I think about, you know, what it, these personal connections people are making, the sort of checking in with people, I do think, Christy, your point about students who don't even know what they need, I think it applies to a lot of us, but thinking about helping, could we develop some kind of a menu of things that help people think for themselves about what they need? Um, I don't know what that looks like, but helping people develop that skill for self-assessment might be another value added of coming out of this time. Um, hopefully it's the last pandemic we'll go through, but it's probably not gonna be the last recession our grad students go through while they're in higher ed. Um, so thinking about how do we help people develop some of those skills, um, I think would be a useful thing to help them learn. I think for me, um... It's been how do I humanize this whole experience, right? Um, in, whether it's classroom um, or practicum or assistantships or whatever it might be, but how do I connect with them as a human um, more and less as a faculty member? Because um, in, I, I'm grateful to have a job. I am grateful to be able to sit at home and, and do the work that I do. Um, and knowing that you know, a lot of the folks outside of higher ed are not able to do that, right? So. Uh, that's one part. The other part of it is, you know, I think the question, the question of life is happening. I have a lot of students that um, I think um, things that they probably didn't reveal um, personal stuff that, you know, whether it was abuse in the family or um, whether it was um, a, a family member who was, you know, sick or fell sick during this, you know, this whole pandemic, um, whether it's related to COVID or, or, or something else, um, things are happening. And um, no, I had a student um, yesterday who said there are three papers due, and this is a student is graduating, um, but there's no homeschooling. You no, know, their little brother, um, and they're you no, know, they're an immigrant family, and parents really are not you know, in the picture to help the student with the with the schoolwork. So the student is um, working two two assistantships, um, two different campuses, um, and so part of me is like, well, you're living life. Like, go do that first, right? The the paper. Um, to me is if I'm able to understand that you have understood the concepts, um, that's enough for me at this moment, right? That you no, know, if you are having to, if, I, if my goal is to test the APA and those kinds of things, which seems so trivial in the moment, then I am totally okay with, with somebody not giving me an 18 page paper or a 20 page paper in the moment, right? So uh, there were things that students had done uh, for, for coursework um, that needed them to go look at the, now I'm teaching a history of higher ed course right now and they had to go and check out archives, which you uh, know is closed right now. And so, um, so we did, you know, students are going to present, you know, the, 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 the part of the work that they've done, we said, you know what, we'll look at that and, and celebrate that. That's what you're able to do and be okay with it. And, and I think in a way that gives them an opportunity to, to, um, to not feel like they've failed at what they were supposed to do, right? I think there's a sense of failure um, that one of my students brought up um, and being able to at least talk about it brings in the vulnerability piece that they know that they were going through. I mean, 
it takes a lot of, you know, a lot of emotion, a lot of guts for a student to come up into a forum and admit that I feel like I'm not doing and I'm not so sure I deserve this degree, right? And I think to calm that and to say that, no, they actually deserve to be here, that they're actually learning everything that they can and um, they're experiencing things that no textbook has been written about yet. Um, people are you now getting ready to write those books. And this is a group of, you know, a cohort of students that are living it firsthand and to let them know that they can trust that um, and, and, and to go support the students they will in the future. Thank you. Um, I think, as you've all referenced, right, they're living the current case studies that will be for, used in the future um, as case studies for future generations. And the, those history of higher ed classes will be forever changed as to what moments were pivotal on college campuses. I'm going to turn it over to some of our uh, participants to ask questions as well. If you do have a question that you would like to ask live and on the air outside of the question and each or answer feature, I ask you to raise your hand. And I'm going to first turn it over to Shane Bora from University of Dayton who had a question. Um, let me, Shane, figure out how to actually make sure that you can chat here in a minute. So while you are um, preparing, I'm going to open it up for you. Okay, you should be able to talk now, Shane. Hi there, everyone. My name is Bora. My pronouns are him and his. I'm currently a first year student in the higher education administration program at the University of Dayton. I was curious about what y'all are doing to support um, your perspective or incoming students, considering yesterday was the you know national deadline. Um, I know there are a lot of anxieties from those students. Here at the University of Dayton, we unfortunately haven't been able to offer any assistantships to incoming students. So um, I'm really curious about how, how are we still helping our students that were even interested in um, pursuing a master's degree or starting in the field? I'll jump in and start. Um, thanks, Shane. And, and thank you for putting that question in the, the sidebar. I had seen it at some point, but it, disappeared. Um, so I think that um, for one thing, um, many institutions have moved the April 15th deadline for admission offers, um, not necessarily assistantship offers, but that there's sort of, there's some in, uh, it's even slushier than usual in some ways. Um, and what we're doing at Michigan State is continue to work really closely um, with our campus partners who provide graduate assistantships and trying to stay um, keep it as transparent as possible with our admitted students about, um, you know, if we start to get uh, indications that something may be going sideways um, in an assistantship they've already been offered, or if we um, know at some point that really this is it, everything that's out there is out there. So if you're sitting with an admissions offer and no assistantship offer, um, and again, Michigan State is a place some students do that, um, you know, we can at least have really honest conversations with students. So trying to kind of keep that transparency there um, and also being transparent and saying like, um, uh, this is the, hmm, how does that, you know, the job market outside of higher ed is not gonna be particularly swell either. Um, so what are all your choices admitted student and let's help you pick the one that is going to be best for you. Remember that you can defer your admission with us for a year if that helps you make a decision. Um, so I think um, the transparency piece, I think it is probably our most ethical stance. Um, for, for my program um, at Salem State, I'm hosting a, again, unfortunately, a Zoom webinar um, in a forum for all of our incoming students that have accepted and have matriculated into the program. Um, just to, just to you know, talk about things that they're feeling and, and going through right now. Some of them are coming straight out of undergrad. Some of you know have work experience. Um, in, in, in all of these students have an assistantship, um, either on campus or in a, in a you know, local community, you know, local college, um, you know, in the Salem area. Um, and I think part of it is to, you know, like you know, what Chris was saying, you know, have an open, honest conversation around 
know what is what is fall going to look like um, at least in the foreseeable future whether you know it's courses um, or assistantships um, I mean some of these students are moving across the country I have a student coming in from California so what does it mean for a student um, you know, should they rent a place in Salem Mass where you know rents are pretty high and um, you know, availability is, is low um, or do they if you do remote and if the person is able to work from home and stay in California, then no. So I think I think um, those are some questions that I don't have all of the answers, but at least hopefully when we you know meet together and and have a conversation, that it'll at least let people start thinking that these are some things that they need to think about. Because for the students that are coming into a graduate program, it's also their first time. If especially if you're a first gen student and you're doing this for the first time and and you really don't have um, an understanding or um, you know the the social capital, if you will, to to navigate um, you no know, grad school. So I'm hoping that we can do that with um, with some of our faculty and some of our practitioners going to join that forum and have that conversation with them. Yeah, our current first year students um, have organized a conversation with our um, incoming students who have secured GA positions. Um, to have conversation about kind of expectations, what that looks like. Um, they, they know from us that um, June is when they'll get information about registering for classes. And we, as Chris said, it's about transparency. So talking about, we, we don't know what's gonna happen in fall yet. Nobody's made that ultimate decision. We're not, we're too early to make that call. So also being really transparent in the fact that it's gonna be about six weeks before I really even have a clear indicator to give you a sense of what are some real possible options that we're dealing with as we look at fall. Um, and also sharing with students that what you hear in the media and from campuses is always worst case scenario. So that's, that's the scenario. Everything's online in the fall. We had the, the whole piece in the inside of higher education blow up that there was announcement in Boston, right? That it was going all, all online. <laughs> and that was only a possible plan. So also kind of talking with students about how uh, you need to plan for worst case scenario. So that's what our worst case scenario looks like at the moment. And then we can back off of that as we see what unfolds in the next six weeks. So also kind of really thinking about um, and giving them some, some context and some frames to think through how things are going to shift and wh when we may actually have some answers um, for what that looks like. Great, right, thank you, that's helpful. I, you know, we're, we're, we're only a month into this and things have shifted so quickly so already and so who knows what a month from now will look like. I'm going to turn it over um, to Hannah Wasco, who is a second year graduate student from GW University to ask a question. Hannah. Hi, can you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much to the panelists for everything you've shared so far. Um, so, uh, yes, I'm a graduating master's student and um, have had some interviews over the past couple of weeks. So I'm just trying to stay hopeful at the moment and just hopeful that something will work out. Um, so my current worry though is about accepting position that could possibly be canceled before the fall like i accept it and then a couple weeks later they come back and say nope sorry that's not happening or maybe a year or two later that position's cut because of financial constraints i'm sure will last for a couple of years now so i'm just wondering if there's a way to tactfully ask an employer how financially stable a position could be um, if offered it so i'll jump in and say this is where your the, the research skills you learned as a higher ed grad student should come in really handy. Um, using your mentors and networks to ask that question for you is probably a good idea. Um, and then, uh, how do I say it? There, there are categories of institutions that we know are more at risk than others. Um, small private colleges without giant endowments are more at risk. I, I have a student who had an offer made, signed, and pulled this week. So it is real that it could happen. And it wasn't at a, like a dicey, questionable school. It's just a small school. Um, so I think that you can do some of that looking, you know, and check it out. I mean, at, at the very minimum, um, you know, looking to see if it's on some of the lists that exists of like schools that could go under in the next 20 years. That was all before COVID. Um, but there are schools that have been predicted to be, that they were going to be on the margins anyway. Um, so I think that's a place to think about it. Um, I think 
uh, using what we learned from the 2008 recession about um, regions that rebound more quickly from recessions than others, I think is, is probably helpful. Um, I live in one that doesn't rebound particularly quickly. Um, also, we didn't go down as far as others, but still we don't rebound as quickly. So I think that there are some ways you can do it, but your mentors are probably a really smart place to start. Um, if I had an offer in hand, it might be, once I had an offer, it might be a question I would ask. I think in the job search process, particularly in this market, I myself probably wouldn't ask that question until the offer was with me. Because I want to get the offer, right? Like, so I would wait. Others might feel differently about timing or strategies. So Chris, I, I do, oh, <laughs> go, ahead, go for it. No, you, I went first. <laughs> well, I think one of the things to remember, Hannah, is that like, like Chris said, we've never been in this situation before. So I think the honest answer is who knows? <laughs> like people don't know. And um, I mean, they're literally talking about a global depression. Like the, we don't know the status of the economy now. And there's so many questions left unanswered. We don't know what the fall is going to look like. We don't know, you know, so um, I agree with what Chris said about I would wait to, to ask that once you got the offer. And this is where your flexibility and planning come. If you, if your question talks about how to plan for a year or two in the job, I would enter that job with a contingency plan in case your job would not last more than a year or two years. And that's just the, the that's what I feel honestly that you, we just don't know. We don't know what the economy is going to be. We don't know the overall impact. We don't know. I think having a vaccine is going to change a lot of things and they say it's a, a year out or so. So um, the best thing you could do is plan for it and ask them to see if they'll give you the honest answer and see if you can trust the answer. And um, that's the best you can do, but you have to go, I believe in my gut. I believe with contacting my mentors and figuring out um, what the contingency plan. I always have something in my back pocket just in case. I was going to um, add um, to build on that too, is that um, my experiences with the students that I've interacted with that have been getting offers, um, especially the further we get into this, is that I found that our colleagues across the country are far more transparent about what they know. So to, to Chris's point earlier about being ethical in our decision making in graduate programs, I really feel our colleagues across the country are trying to do their best to be ethical in their hiring practices right now as well because they don't know the answers to the questions. So I think that they're they're more forthcoming with what they do know and then they're going to be pretty honest to say, uh, I don't know what to tell you. Um, this is what I'm cleared to do at this moment in time. And so I want to do this because we've got work that needs to be done and we need to support the students on our campus. Um, but just like anything that we're unsure about, as Christina talked about, we just don't know what will happen for six weeks from now to know what that impact will be. So then it's that plan B. But I, re I really do believe that, the, that folks are being ethical across the board in our um, institutions and trying to do the best that they can to serve um, our students in this hiring process. Thank, thank you all. And I think you're right. We, we chose a person-centered career for a reason. And so people do want to be open and, and honest with all candidates that are searching. Um, in the interest of time, I know that it is already 311 um, Eastern time. And so we only have a couple minutes left. And this is a really robust conversation. And I appreciate all of the question and answers. I know we probably didn't get to all of them. Uh, but I do want to be cognizant of time. And hopefully we can continue to have a lot of these conversations in our networks after today as well. This is obviously a population that we all care uh, quite a, a bit about it and are still trying to figure out ways to best support grad students. But there have been some great ideas shared today from our esteemed faculty and from other participants who shared information as well. Just a few closing notes. Um, this has been recorded and it will be posted on the Aku Hawaii resource page. So I do want to uh, remind folks that they can go there and they can continue to find uh, lots of information um, as I mentioned, not only this webinar, but other webinars moving forward as well. 
In addition, uh, the TPE resource page is there for those of you who are job searching. We are also continuing to increase our resources and doing webinars about many of these kind of specific topics about how to accept jobs, how to potentially accept an offer on a campus that you've never visited, what that might look like. So continue to go there as well. Um, also on the Aku Hawaii page, we have data from our straw polls. Uh, we have done, Aku Hawaii has done three straw polls. The most recent was released this past Friday. We will be administering our fourth straw poll this next week on Monday, April 20th. Uh, and the associated data will then be released next Friday, April 24th. The primary focus will actually be talking more about understanding revenue loss and the implications for operations. So a uh, discussion point that came up multiple times today. So definitely be on the lookout for that. Um, and then we also have three additional virtual roundtables next week. On April 22nd is a virtual roundtable, a space for professionals of color. On April 23rd, next Thursday, is our virtual roundtable on marketing and communications approaches. And then on Friday the 24th is a virtual roundtable focused on our small colleges and universities. So definitely please feel free to, to check out all of those resources. I just want to take this time to thank all four of our faculty. It is a busy time, um, both on your campuses, in your classes, with everything that you're clearly doing for your students um, and your own lives outside of academia as well. And so I appreciate you taking the time today to provide such thoughtful uh, insight to all of these participants. And to our participants, thank you for making it a robust conversation. So uh, we wish that sometimes it wasn't as doom and gloom as it seems, but the nice thing about uh, academia is, you know, bricks and mortar will still be here in the future and, and we'll get through this and we look forward to continuing to work with you in the meantime. So with that, I wish everyone a healthy and great rest of your day. So take care everyone and thank you. Bye everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Be safe. Take care.